Okay, on behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver, I'd like to welcome you all to the discussion with the distinguished legal scholar and democratic theorist Muhammad Fuddle, whose lecture will be followed by a commentary from Michelle Michel, professor at the Corbell School. I'd like to begin by thanking Fred Nanda and the co-sponsors of today's event, the Nanda Center for International and Comparative Law, uh, here at the Stern College of Law, and a special thanks to Carolyn Shore, the Center's Administrative Director. Um, I'd also like to thank the students of the law school who have been involved in putting this event together, specifically the Middle Eastern and North African Law Students Association, who are co-sponsor of today's event. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, the Alibaba restaurant for providing the food. And obviously, the food is delicious because it's all been consumed. And so thanks to them for providing the cuisine for today's event. Um, I'm not sure what all of you were doing this summer, but much of my summer was consumed by sitting in front of my computer and um, in front of the television following the dramatic events in Egypt in the lead up to the uh, June 30th protest and the subsequent uh, military coup a few days later. Um, the fate of the Arab Spring uh, in general is deeply tied to the politics of one of the most important arguably the most important country <coughs> Egypt, as the saying goes, in Egypt uh, shakes the rest of the field, field tremors, and um, things have, I think, taken an ominous turn in terms of Egypt's uh, democratic uh, transition, or, or lack thereof of a democratic transition. But one of the people that I've uh, turned to to help interpret and assess events in Egypt has been um, our keynote speaker today, Professor uh, Mohammed Fadl. Um, I was trying to remember as I was coming to um, coming to school today when I first met Mohammed, and um, I couldn't, you know, find the exact date of time. Um, I did read several of the scholarly articles on his website. I recall seeing him frequently on Canadian television. But I do have a vivid memory that that, that he and I, and another uh, scholar of Islam and human rights, someone who is perhaps equally well known. Um, Professor Abdullahi Anani at Emory University, the three of us had a roundtable discussion a couple of years ago, a uh, very sure. thoughtful exchange and um, sort of discussion about these issues related to the intersection of Islam, democracy, and, and human rights. And then more recently, uh, I've been very impressed by Mohammed Fadr by virtue of his interventions and his observations on um, Egypt's post uh, Mubarak uh, politics, particularly his. Um, postings on his blog, but most uh, specifically his postings on the sociology of Islam list server. Uh, what I've enjoyed about his contribution is that they often challenge our contemporary received wisdom about the process of democratization, uh, generally, but more specifically, the process of democratization and its discontents in the Arab world. And that led to this invitation today. For those of you who do not know him, Mohamed Fadl is an associate professor and Canada research chair at the University of Toronto, where he's cross appointed in the Faculty of Law, the Department of Religion, and the Department of Near and Eastern Civilizations. He served as a law clerk to the Honorable Paul B. Niemeyer of the U.S. Uh, of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth District, and the Honorable Anthony, Anthony Palemo of the United States District Court um, for the Southern District of Georgia. Professor Fadl has published extensively and influentially in the areas of Islamic legal history, uh, international human rights, liberalism, and democratic theory. Our discussant today is our colleague, uh, Michelle Luce. She's a full professor at the University of Denver Joseph Corbell School, and she's also an affiliate member of our newly established Center for Middle East Studies. Her books include The History of Human Rights from Ancient Times to the Globalization Era, The Human Rights Reader, uh, Major Political Essays, which is Documents from the Bible to the Presence, Internationalism as Betrayal, and Nationalism Reader. And more specifically, Micheline Miche has uh, been living in the Arab world during the Arab Spring, and so she brings first hand sort of experience and knowledge. She's also working on a book on the Arab Spring, which makes her, for all of those reasons, a perfect interlocutor to participate in today's discussion and um, in this afternoon's conversation. Uh, Professor Fuddle will speak for approximately 30 minutes on the announced topic of the crisis in Egypt, liberalism, Islamism, and the struggle for democracy. 
Um, Michelle and Fouché will um, offer some comments for about five to seven minutes. I will facilitate some back and forth, and then we'll turn it over to questions and answers. So without further <coughs> delay, please join me in welcoming to the uh, University of Denver, Professor Ron McDonald. Um, thank you, Professor Hashim, for that very generous and most undeserved and exaggerated introduction, but I'll take whatever I can get, because maybe at the end you won't be so happy. <laughs> but um, anyway, we're here to talk about a subject which is very close to me personally. I'm native Egyptian, um, although I grew up in the United States. And when the January 25th revolution took place, I think like a lot of us, particularly Egyptians living in the United States and lots of other uh, Egyptians living abroad and lots of people who are sympathetic to Egypt because they love Egypt, uh, we watched the events unfold on a daily basis with bated breath. And we couldn't imagine our joy and ecstasy when Hosea Robotic designed on February 11, 2011. That was a day that seemed full of um, unlimited opportunities for the future of the country. And so now, two and a half years later, we stand and look at Egypt, and it seems like at least this phase in the struggle for democratization is over, and it's been uh, defeated, unfortunately. And so now the question is to look back and figure out what went wrong. There have been lots of explanations given. Um, some of my colleagues in political science, particularly Nathan Brown, have put the blame on a very, poor, a very poorly designed transitional process. Then his view made it impossible for the various different actors, political actors in Egypt, to establish any, any kind of sufficient mutual trust to get the transition completed. Right? And he sort of attributes this to more incompetence rather than malevolence. Other commentators have just attributed uh, the breakdown basically to uh, incompetence on a grand scale in the political leadership of Egyptian political parties, but in particular the Muslim Brotherhood. Others have emphasized uh, the devastating economic crisis in which Egypt finds itself, which was, was which it had already found itself prior to the revolution, in which the revolution simply exacerbated uh, factors that made it impossible for the transitional governments to um, govern effectively. Now, in my view, all of these explanations have some persuasive power. And what I'm going to say today is certainly not intended to be uh, taken as you know, an exclusion of these other, uh, other um, explanations. But I come to this from the perspective of a legal scholar and uh, a scholar of political theory who's interested in the idea of the kind of moral determinant of a just political society and then how those, how our ideal conceptions of the elements of a just political society ought to shape the kinds of political decisions we make in real life, right? So I look at this problem from the perspective of how ideal theory as well, should inform our decisions in our political practice and non-ideal theory. And here, I think the problem essentially was that many of the revolutionaries in Egypt um, simply did not understand this. They did not understand the difference between ideal theory and non-ideal theory. And they were overly committed to an idealistic conception of what Egypt could be and when it could be, and when it could be such. And as a result, I think, um, they consistently took decisions that undermined the possibility of achieving a flawed but uh, improved democracy improved relative to the pre-2011 uh, revolution in the hope of obtaining a much more perfect polity, which I think was never on the table. And as a result, they ended up inadvertently strengthening the hands of authoritarian forces in Egypt, which we see today, right? The army and the police back in charge. So this is my case for that argument. We need to begin with the facts on the ground, so to speak. Um, and I call it the Tahrir Coalition. Who were the people that came together to remove Hosni Mubarak and his regime? Well, I think we can draw, or I classify them into three broad groups. <coughs> the first group was a group of Egyptians who believed that the basic problem of 
Egypt could be focused on Mubarak, his immediate family, and a close circle of advisors. Right? This was focused on the idea of the, what the Egyptians called Tawrid. The fear that Hosni Mubarak was going to appoint his son to be his successor. Right? And so that Egypt would follow the way of Syria, whereby the president dies, long live the president, his son. Right? And this was um, a threat that many people in Egypt uh, recognized, and they thought it was unacceptable, even among people in the security establishment, because they saw it, in some respects, as threatening their, threatening their own interests. Right? Uh, because prior to prior to Hamad Morsi, actually, every single president of Egypt had come from the military. Mubarak's son was not from the military, right? And so uh, many, many in the military, particularly, perceived the threat of appointing Mubarak's son as a dangerous departure from the norms of legitimacy that had been established by the Free Officers' Revolution in 1952. Right? So call this the minimalist interpretation of the revolution. You get rid of Mubarak and his supporters, and then the revolution has succeeded. The second view of the revolution is what I call a reformist review of the revolution. One that viewed um, the goal of the revolution as not destroying the Egyptian state, not uprooting the Egyptian state, but rather fixing it, so that the Egyptian state would now become a subject, a state that was subject to legality. Right? So the Egyptian state had a constitution, it had laws, right? It had laws prohibiting all sorts of things that Egyptians were complaining about, like corruption, um, uh, prohibitions of torture, etc., etc. But the Mubarak regime had, had systematically undermined the norm of legality in Egypt, right? Largely because it had become, well, it was, it was effectively <coughs> Egypt. It was immune from any kind of public oversight. So the reformist view of the Egyptian revolution, in my opinion, was of the, uh, was of the view that what we need in Egypt is democracy. What we need is democratic accountability, right? Um, because that's, what's pro that's what the problem in Egypt is. The problem in Egypt is not the substantive law. The problem is a lack of accountability, and democracy would provide that accountability, right? So the problem was not neoliberalism. The problem was not privatization. The problem, the problem was not uh, all these substantive problems in the country. The problem was a lack of accountability due to the absence of democratic, uh, democratic uh, legitimacy and an absence of a rule of law, right? Uh, so this is the reformist interpretation of the revolution, right? And then the third view is what I call the radical view of the revolution. The radical view of the revolution was that the revolution was about fundamentally restructuring the nature of relations between state and society um, from the from from the from from A to Z, right? Now. The problem with the radical interpretation, as, as I'm describing here, is it gives the impression that there's one view of how the state should be restructured. And in fact, there are many different views within this camp. Right? So you have liberals, that we don't consider liberals, we have uh, radicals, but in the Egyptian context, yes, because the Egyptian state was not a liberal state. So one group of radicals was they wanted a complete transformation of the state so that it would be uh, emblematic of the norm, substantive norms of a liberal or a liberal post-World War II liberal policy, including the relationship of religion to society. You also had radical socialists, right, who wanted to undo all market reforms that the Mubarak regime had instituted for the 15 years prior to the revolution in the name of restoring some kind of uh, regime that privileged workers over the rest of society. Now, what's important is that both of these, I would say, represent radical views of the, inter of the, of the revolution. Um, and are you know, inherently a conflict with the two others. At the risk of oversimplification, one might identify the first interpretation of the revolution as the stance of the Egyptian military. The second interpretation of the revolution is that of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the third interpretation as that of the younger generation of Egyptians who initiated the January 25th revolution. Now, it's difficult to say with any kind of certainty right, how strong each interpretation was on the ground during those magical 18 days, right? Um, but we know some things. We know, for example, that the military was the last to join the, call, the coalition. Right? Um, called, out on, called out by multiple Mubarak on January 28th ostensibly to crush the protesters, the military instead asserted its independence from the regime and by, by taking a stance of neutrality, essentially waiting to see who was going to win between the protesters and the robotic security services. 
And once it became clear that the protesters were going to defeat the security services, they intervened and told Obama he had to go. Okay. Now, one should not dismiss the military as part of the Fakir coalition, as I call it. Even though it only played an unusual role, the protesters in Fakir themselves embraced the military, welcoming them, or ostensibly welcoming them, uh, on the belief that they would be more sympathetic to their demands than the detested police force of the Ministry of Interior. Now, the partial embrace of the military by the protesters was not the only indication that the removal of Obama in this inner circle is le was a legitimate interpretation of January 5th revolution. For example, even genuinely liberal revolutionaries right, seem to act as though there was re residual legal, residual legitimacy to the order that Mubarak had established, the constitutional and legal order that Mubarak had established. Even though in 2010, uh, Mubarak had passed uh, farcical constitutional amendments following a farcical parliamentary election solely for the purpose to secure the succession of his son. So, for example, Hassan Bahajat, who was a well-known human rights lawyer in Egypt, published an ad in the Washington Post spelling out what Mubarak needed to do so that the formal legality could be, could be preserved. Right? So there's still this idea that the legal structure of the state right, and other institutions besides Mubarak were legitimate. Right? So we shouldn't dismiss the idea that the military was viewed by Egyptians as part of the revolution coalition. Um, now, if we have any doubts about this, I think if we look at the subsequent elections, we will see Right, that there was, there was a great deal of popular support for uh, what I'm calling the first interpretation, or the second, or more negatively, very little popular support for the third radical uh, interpretation of the revolution. So if we begin by looking at the March 19th referendum, which sort of set out the roadmap for the transition, right, the radical supporters of the radical view of the revolution came out strongly against this roadmap. Because the roadmap um, contemplated very small amendments to the 1971 Constitution and then a quick series of elections to restore some kind of formal government. They were opposed to this. They wanted a complete overhaul, as I said earlier, of, uh, of the state. Right? But they were roundly defeated. 77% of the voters approved the roadmap, albeit only 41% of the eligible uh, voters participated. Right? Um, then if we look at the next series of elections, the parliamentary elections, Again, the radical uh, uh, support, the radical view of the, of the revolution did very poorly in the parliamentary elections. So the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi party, which was an extremely conservative religious group, together they won over two-thirds of the votes cast in the parliamentary elections. Right? Uh, Post-revolution parties, who arguably represented the radical interpretation of the revolution, only managed to get 15% of the total votes cast. By contrast, a pre-revolutionary sort of um, uh, crony capitalist party, such as the New Left, received almost 10% of the votes. Right? So they were barely outpolling, right, a, you know, the uh, a, a, a old regime-related political party. Again, the rejection of the re of the radical interpretation of the revolution was confirmed yet again in the polling for the presidency. Right? In the first round of the presidential elections. Ahmed Shafiq, who had been Mubarak's last <coughs> prime minister before he resigned, received almost 25% of the votes cast in the first round of the election. Right? Another member of the old regime, Ahmed Musa, who had been Mubarak's foreign minister and then became Secretary General of the Arab League, received another 11%. So that means close Mubarak allies received about a third of the presidential votes cast. Now, one might say, well, that means that the other two-thirds went to candidates who came from the Tahrir coalition. That's true. Mohammed Mursi got about 26%. Hamdin Sabah, he got about 20%. Abdel Munaf and Tahrir got about um, 18%. The problem was, however, that they were extremely divided internally. And this, should, this came out in the second round. In the second round of the presidential elections, the runoff between Morsi and Shafiq Morsi only ended up winning by a relatively narrow uh, margin of three and a half points. He ended up getting 51.7% of the vote as opposed to Shafiq's 48.3% or something. Now, how do we explain that? Well, the only way we can explain that 
is that the vote, the 20% who had voted for Hamzim Sabahi, which was a, he was a kind of Nasserist, socialist kind of candidate, um, split more in favor of Shafiq than they did for Morsi, by probably a ratio of, of three to two. Right? So that's, that told us already from the presidential election that um, there was deep divisions within the Tahrir coalition, and these would manifest themselves, um, I think, in, in the rest of the transition. Another important um, point that the voting patterns disclosed was a severe division, or severe, um, that, that Egypt had become radically divided along geographic lines, right? So the Muslim Brotherhood, while it had substantial support in all areas of the country, right, it was the only political force with substantial uh, political support in all areas of the country, right? Uh, was nevertheless a distinct minority party in the major urban centers. However, the other political parties, while strong in the cities, Cairo and Alexandria, were absent everywhere else. So you have, you have a country that's polarized, not only along, as we'll see, religious, secular lines, but also, crucially, along geographical lines between the countryside and the city, with the Muslim Brotherhood dominating uh, 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 the countryside in terms of political support. But after these um, four rounds of elections, it became very obvious that the two most important political forces in the country were the Muslim Brotherhood and the old, old regime. But it was also obvious that no single political party had sufficient support uh, to govern the country on its own. As a result, in my opinion, right, any reasonable person would look at this and determine that a successful and peaceful democratic transition would require some accommodation of the old regime, a willingness on the part of the Muslim Brotherhood to exercise restraint in pursuing an Islamist agenda, and in fact, I would say, place constraints on the kind of social path we could reasonably expect to emerge uh, uh, out of the Egyptian Revolution. Right? And this shouldn't really surprise us. John Rawls mentioned or discussed the difference between a society characterized by modus vivendi on the one hand and an overlapping consensus on the other. A modus vivendi, as the name suggests, is suggested more of a truce rather than a, per than a permanent peace. It comes into existence when a warring, when warring parties in society, having become exhausted and, and having despaired of fully defeating their adversaries, <coughs> agree to live together pursuant to a constitution that guarantees certain procedural and political rights. So according to Rawls, we can expect that in deeply divided societies, the, original con the, the initial constitution that will be drafted will be relatively thin on a whole host of questions, guaranteeing only the most core procedural democratic rights. Right? Um, in contrast to what Rawls calls a, a just constitution, which should, be, which should be able to win the support of everybody in society and generate a more, uh, a deep, a more deeper and more stable uh, uh, overlapping consensus. But nevertheless, right, when we look at Egypt, um, and we look at normative political theory, it's hard to escape the conclusion that it would have been impossible to draft a liberal constitution in the Rawlsian sense, given the fact that the social divisions in the country were precisely uh, those that precluded the writing of a fully liberal constitution. Now, Rawls does not write extensively on the means by which a constitution born in social circumstances um, productive of a modus vivendi could lead to a more politically stable constitution over time. But he, it seems that he believed that in the usual course of things, societies that now enjoy an overlapping consensus evolved out of a past of deep division, right, in which society was governed by modus vivendi, but over time, um, questions of rights, toleration, etc., develop, they can broaden until um, uh, we get what's known today as a, a liberal constitution. Right? Now, for Rawls, the reason why most of them had the potential to evolve into something more, something more, like more attractive was this confidence that human beings, once they began to recognize the possibility that they could benefit from cooperating with their former adversaries, and then actually reap the benefits of such cooperation, engage in a process of mutual restraint in their political demands. And this results in a marked increase in the appreciation of moral toleration as a virtue, rather than simply political, to co political toleration as um, something that's grudgingly given. So yes, we can easily recognize that Egypt, post-Mubarak, 
toleration was at best a political value. It did not have deep moral roots, but that, again, from the perspective of Rawls, is not surprising. It's what we should expect in a deeply divided society. The vert moral toleration as a virtue only develops over time on his account of how we develop a just society. So, a modus vivendi need not develop into a just society, but it seems to be a condition precedent in actual non-ideal theory before real states develop um, sort of deep level norms. Now, from the perspective of ideal theory, right, this kind of thin procedural democracy is obviously deficient relative uh, to the constitution of a well-ordered society. But it is clearly superior to civil war or authoritarianism. Authoritarianism being simply another species or another mode of civil war. And the reason for this is clear. A procedural democracy presents the possibility, not the guarantee, but the possibility of new patterns of cooperation that could undermine old suspicions of divided society and lead to the adoptions of policies that tend to benefit all sectors of society, not just those with greater access to force. So while procedural democracy is inferior to democracy motivated by justice and fairness on a knowledge account, right, in the realm of non-ideal theory, the world of practical politics, we can't be indifferent to a choice between outright authoritarianism and mere procedural democracy. The latter offers a clear route to achieving a well-ordered society while also preserving important features of a well-ordered society, such, including such valuable rights as protections against arbitrary arrests, the right to participate in elections, to choose your mode of governance, uh, the right to have a voice, right, essentially, in selecting one's rulers. The former, i.e. Author an authoritarian state, offers no clear route to any conception of democracy, procedural or otherwise. It is likely to be much more violent and less respectful of political rights than, than a mere procedural democracy. From, more, from a practical perspective then, the most powerful political actors in Egypt after the 25th revolution both rejected a radical interpretation of the revolution um, in favor either of the narrow view or the reformist view. Normative liberal, liberal theory, meanwhile, also suggested that the possibility of obtaining a constitution um, satisfying the requirements of liberal ideal theory was implausible. It's against this backdrop that I suggest that we, from a normative perspective, evaluate the trajectory of Egypt's failed democratic transition. And so it's from that perspective that I want to analyze the preeminent crisis of the, Morsi, of the year Morsi spent in office, namely his decision in November to issue constitutional proclamations insulating his decision from judicial review and immunizing the word of the constituent assembly that was drafting Egypt's constitution. It's safe to say that Morsi's November constitutional declaration was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back with respect to his relationship and the most important of his relationship with the more radical uh, revolutionaries. For the radical revolutionaries, Morsi's attempt to place his decisions beyond the purview of judicial review um, was an attempt to reconstitute uh, the authoritarianism of, of Mubarak. But that they, for example, claimed that, Mubarak, that Morsi was now more powerful, than, uh, more powerful than anyone in Egyptian history since the days of the pharaohs. Right? Um, I think what this analysis ignored was the problem that the Supreme Constitutional Court posed to the integrity and the possibility of a democratic transition. The Supreme Constitutional Court had already shown itself to be quite activist during the transitional process. For example, it made the bold decision, to say the least, of dissolving Egypt's first popularly elected parliament in over 50 years, based on a technicality um, in the voting laws. Right? Doesn't seem very democratic to me. Right? They also, on the same day that they made the decision dissolving uh, Egypt's parliament, they also overturned a law passed by that parliament prohibiting um, Ahmed Shafiq and other close, um, uh, uh, other politicians closely associated with Mubarak from running in the presidential elections. Right? So here you have two extremely activist decisions by the Supreme Constitutional Court, which went counter to the democratically expressed will of the Egyptian people, namely that parliament and to exclude uh, the, the close circle of robotics advisors from political life, at least during the transition toward democracies. 
But the real issue, however, was not Morsi's powers and Morsi becoming a dictator. It was rather the makeup of the Constituent Assembly and the substance of the draft constitution. In particular, the role of religion in the proposed constitution, at least for liberals like Muhammad al-Baradi. Baradi complained that the, the makeup of the Constitutional Assembly was biased toward Egypt's Islamists. Um, the members of the Constituent Assembly had been selected by the parliament. And since Islamists had won two-thirds of the votes, they naturally dominated membership in the Constituent Assembly. Liberals denied that the results of the first parliamentary elections should be given such weight in determining membership in the Constituent Assembly. The liberals like Baradi argued that given the long history of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egyptian, in Egyptian society, it founded in the 20s, it had a natural leg up, so to speak, in, com in competing for people's votes. And so naturally, in the first set of elections, they would win a disproportionate share of votes. And this, and this so the, the receiving two thirds of the votes was an unreasonably high um, representation of their actual support in society. Liberals also objected to the substance of the proposed constitution, primarily because they thought too many fundamental rights and freedoms were being sacrificed, or unreasonable limitations were being placed on their exercise in the name of ambiguous values such as religion, morality, or family values. They argued that the constitution would not be legitimate unless it was a consensual document, one capable of gaining mutual acceptance by all significant social groups in Egypt. The substantive demand for a consensual document, however, belied the reality of a deeply divided society including one that was deeply divided precisely on the question of to what extent the state should underwrite personal rights and freedoms that contradicted widespread and deeply held religious beliefs, such as the sanctity of Muslim and biblical prophets. In short, it's hard to understand um, what the liberal demand for um, consensual, a consensual a constitution could have meant from a practical perspective, given that large swaths of Egyptian populace were not particularly sympathetic to the notion of freedom of expression, for example, includes an unqualified right to blasphemy. The argument that the Constituent Assembly unreasonably exaggerated the strength of the Islamist parties was certainly more plausible. But even if one were to grant this point, Islamists would have still represented a significant, perhaps even the largest block in the Constituent Assembly in any plausible scenario in which the members of the Constituent Assembly were selected by some kind of democratic process. And indeed, the process adopted in the wake of the coup confirms this observation, at least indirectly. The current membership of the Committee of 50, which is tasked with debating proposed amendments to the 2012 Constitution, were all appointed by the military, directly or indirectly, without any connection to the popular will as expressed in voting. So in short, even if a different process had been used to select membership in the Constituent Assembly, the Islamist bloc would have been large enough to block any constitution which purported to guarantee the conventional personal rights and freedoms which we associate with liberal post-World War II democracies. In short, there was no plausible path for liberals to obtain a constitution that secured the rights that they valued um, and which they insisted were the sine qua non for legitimacy without excluding Islamists entirely or virtually entirely from the process, something, of course, that has now taken place as a result of the coup. Given the fact that they could not achieve um, the constitution they desired, liberal, liberals in the Constituent Assembly chose the path of boycott. Not only to undermine the legitimacy of the process, but also in a not so subtle sign to invite the Egypt Supreme Constitutional Court uh, to invalidate the whole procedure, to declare the Constituent Assembly unconstitutional, strike it down, and force a rewind of the whole process. This would have been an extremely dangerous development Right? Because, as I already mentioned, the Supreme Constitutional Court had already dissolved the parliament. So who would have appointed the new constituent assembly? There would have been a real risk at that point in time that the military would again have to step in and take charge of uh, the constitutional writing process. So it was a, an extremely, uh, I, I think, difficult and great period for the democratic transition in Egypt. So it was against this backdrop of a pre-existing logjam in the constitutional drafting pro pro process, with no reasonable hope of consensual resolution, um, that was the act. And it's important to note that with right to the respect to the political provisions of the constitution, meaning the structure of government, the mixed presidential uh, parliamentary system that was proposed, presidential powers, powers of parliament, powers of cabinet, etc., there was no controversy about any of those. 
What was controversial was certain rights provisions and certain jurisdictions of, of the military over civilians. But the political provisions uh, were an object of the Constitution. So against this background, Morsi issued this controversial constitutional declaration, which was clearly intended to prevent the Egyptian judiciary from interfering with the constitutional drafting process, so that a draft of the Constitution could be completed in, 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 in connection with the six-month deadline that had been set forth in the roadmap that the Egyptian people had voted on and approved, and so it could be submitted to them for popular referendum. Again, all in accordance with the March 2011 referendum, which had passed by 77%. So in hindsight, it's easy to point to Morsi's constitutional declarations as a tragic mistake, right? but the real question is to look at it from an ex-ante perspective rather than an ex-post perspective. Right? I think it was perfectly reasonable for somebody in Morsi's position uh, to be fearful of what the Supreme Constitutional Court would do, given what it had already done. And it was also perfectly reasonable for somebody in that position to be worried about what would happen to the prospect of a democratic transition if, in fact, the Supreme Constitutional Court did exercise power and dissolve the Constituent Assembly. So here we have a country that's, in, that's profoundly divided on many issues regarding uh, the scope of personal rights and freedoms. There's a constitutional law jam, right? And the decision maker is either going to be a Supreme Constitutional Court, which is unelected, and has no democratic accountability to the Egyptian people. Or you have an elected president who is accountable to the Egyptian people. Now, as a matter of relative democratic accountability and relative democratic legitimacy, it seems to me that there is really no question here that the decision maker with the greater amount of democratic legitimacy is the elected president. And he should be the party that's entrusted with resolving this logjam not an unelected body of courts of judges to say nothing of the fact that they had been appointed by the previous dictator right? and had already taken several undemocratic steps. Right? Now, this is true only on the condition that the Constitution that he was acting to defend right, satisfies at least the Rawlsman concept of a minimalist procedural democracy. Right? And that's where I think um, we need to focus our attention. <coughs> Did the Constitution that was under consideration in November of 2012 satisfy the, satisfy the requirements of a minimal, minimalist proceduralist democracy? And if so, I think people who support democratic transition would have had no choice but to support Morsi's decision. Now, if we, looked at, if we look at that text, um, it no doubt provided a much more open political system than that which had pre prevailed under the previous 1971 Constitution and which had been canceled in the wake of the January 2011 revolution. It opened up political space using three different strategies. It increased formal political rights. It reduced the power of the president and increased the power of the prime minister. And finally, it increased the power of parliament. So under the first category of reforms, the new constitution provided a self-executing constitutional right to form political parties and to publish print media. By contrast, during the Mubarak era, the formation of political parties was conditional upon approval of government. And surprise, surprise, this government never approved the licensing of a new political party. Likewise, you could now publish newspapers without receiving a prior license from the government, something you could not do during the Mubarak era. Under the second category of reforms, the 2012 Constitution limited the president to two terms which had not been the case under the 1971 Constitution. Crucially, it eliminated the President's unilateral power to declare a state of emergency, something that had been a fundamental demand of the January 2011 revolution, an end to the state of emergency. Under the new Constitution, the President could only declare a state of emergency for seven days without getting approval of the Parliament. And then, even after Parliament gave approval, it had to be submitted to a popular vote. Right? So the ability of the president and even the government to declare a state of emergency had been profoundly restricted. Remember, remembering that Egypt had been in a state of emergency for over 30 years during the robotic regime. Um, it also eliminated the president's unilateral, po unilateral power to dismiss the prime minister. So while the president had the power to appoint the prime minister, he could no longer dismiss him at will. Rather, that power was now vested in the parliament who had the right to withdraw confidence from the government generally or particular prime ministers. And when it did so, 
then the parliament, the president would be forced to choose a prime minister from the par from the party with uh, the law having the largest block in parliament. Significantly, critics of the 2012 Constitution did not focus on its political provisions. It would not surprise me, since the fact, since I already mentioned, that there had been agreement on the political provisions. Um, instead, the locus of criticism, particularly from liberals and leftists, centered on the relationship of religion to the state and in what, in their view, was insufficient protection of social rights. There were several provisions that, I'll, that were controversial, but I'll just focus on a couple. The first was uh, Article 4. Uh, Article 4 provided that the views of a group called the Council of Senior Scholars of the USA, or the USA being a seminary, essentially, the, the official government establishment, that the views of the Council of Senior Scholars of the USA would be taken into account in connection with matters pertaining to Islamic law. In combination with Article 219, which provided a, a definition of Islamic law that would have included the basic methodological premises and substantive principles of historical Islamic law. So according to these critics, when these two provisions were read together, Article 4 and Article 219, it would produce a theocratic state in which the religious institution of Al-Azhar would have the final say in all state legislation. Whereas under the previous um, uh, constitution, although it declared Islamic law to be the principal source of legislation, there was no doubt that the only uh, institution of power to interpret the content of Islamic law was the Egyptian uh, court system. Um, others decried religious limitations on free speech, in particular the exclusion of blasphemous speech directed against Quranic and biblical pro uh, prophets from constitutional protection. Another provision that was controversial was the provision that provided that exercise of personal rights, including things like right of uh, freedom of speech, rights of publication, etc., must be exercised in such a way as not to undermine traditional family values of Egypt. Right? So presumably you couldn't write advocating for same-sex marriage or something. Right. Um, the Constitution's provisions on religious freedom were also criticized insofar as they limited the constitutionally guaranteed, guaranteed free exercise of religion to the three revealed religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right. So while freedom of conscience was absolute, the freedom to practice religion was limited to the three Abrahamic faiths. Finally, the fact that the Constitution contemplated that in certain circumstances, military courts could exercise jurisdiction over civilians was also the object of outrage. Critics on the left also contradict, are also a critical of the Constitution because it failed to guarantee sufficient social rights in their opinion, in particular, rights related to health, education, and labor. Um, although the Constitution recognized certain substantive rights in these areas, it did not spell out guaranteed minimums, for example, for the national budget. For example, that 10% of the national budget would go to health care, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So they felt that it was a dead letter. Now, from the perspective of liberal theory, there's no doubt that the individual rights provisions of the 2012 Constitution are deficient, or were deficient. Right? Um, on the other hand, we also have to point out that it provided that it was the role of the political branches and not the judiciary to specify how the community's moral values would trump individual rights. And in this fashion, it was radically different, or it is radically different, from the theocratic constitution of the Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, of course, it's the, the jurists, the theo theologians, the religious scholars, that exercise a check through the courts over the political lawmaking of the elected parliament. But it was not that way in this constitution. In this constitution, although there were theoretical limits on personal rights in the name of religion and, community, and communitarian values. It was up to the legislature to actually define what those meant. So you couldn't have a situation in the future where you had sort of um, conservative judges on their own acting to limit personal rights. Right? There had to be poli deliberate political decisions of representatives that were politically accountable to the Egyptian people. I think this is a very important point that few people have paid sufficient attention to. The same thing is true with the provision authorizing military courts over uh, military trials for civilians. If you read the provision, what it says is in accordance to law. So this provision could not be activated until 
the elected branches of the Egyptian government, the, the executive and the legislature, actually gave some flesh to it. It did not give freestanding power to the military to grab civilians and try them in court. Again, a huge advantage, a huge advance over the state of the emergency that existed under Mubarak's reign when anybody could be uh, subject to military trial. As for the claim that Article 4, combined with Article 219, would have vested the Assad with ultimate power to determine the validity of Egyptian law, we will never know how those provisions would have been interpreted. What we do know, however, is that Islam al Aryan was a prominent member of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? Uh, and speak, their sp I think the speaker uh, of the, the, the Majlis of Shura, the, sort of the Senate, which had not been dissolved, the Rump Parliament, um, denied in a speech delivered on the floor of the, the Majlis that Article 4 required Parliament to obtain pre approval from the Azhar before it passed the law. He stated emphatically that under the Constitution, lawmaking powers derived exclusively from the people. And that the purpose of Article 4 was simply to confirm that the Azhar was independent of the state, it could make its own decision, and that the state had the right, but not the obligation, to take advice from the Azhar with respect to questions of Islamic law. As for Article 219, while its critics stated it was an attempt to rewrite the Constitutional Court's constitutional understanding of the Sharia, its plain terms were inclusive, not exclusive, meaning that the definition simply said that the definition of the Sharia includes these various things. It didn't say that the definition of Sharia is limited to these things. Right? Now, Article 219 could only be viewed as radically undermining Egyptian courts' approach to questions related to Islamic law if courts were to have read the provision in a manner contrary to its plain terms. Yeah. Given what's happened in Egypt, I guess anything is possible, right? Um, but that possibility seemed far-fetched at the time, and given the demonstrated hostility that Egyptian courts have shown to the Muslim Brotherhood, it seems even more preposterous now. So despite all the hand-wringing about the new religious provisions of the Constitution, at the end of the day, the religious status quo was not changed in any fundamental way, except perhaps by constitutionalizing the criminalization of blasphemy. The more important structural feature of the 2012 Constitution was the fact that it left ambiguous the content of, of not only many rights, but also the limitations of these rights, leaving these questions to future legislation. In this respect, from a, pers from a constitutional you know, structure perspective, the most important innovation of the 2012 Constitution was to vest a lot more power in the political branches and take away power from the judicial branch. This might be an explanation as to why the courts were so hostile. Now, we can have a long debate on the legitimacy of such a strategy from the perspective of Norman constitutional theory, but it's not, it is not unsurprising in light of the profound social divisions existing in Egypt that, uh, uh, regarding the content of the rights that constitutional drafters would want to kick the can down the road and leave it, leave uh, resolution uh, to future uh, political uh, uh, debate. In fact, from a Rawlsian perspective, we would expect a society characterized by a modus vivendi and not an overlapping consensus to adopt a constitution that only provided for a minimum of judicially vindicated rights, and that those rights would be the political rights necessary for democratic participation in public lawmaking. And I think, uh, in fact, that the 2012 constitution successfully did that job. Now, many critics of the 2012 Constitution and ultimate supporters of the coup, at least initially, uh, advanced a militant democracy theory to justify the military, military intervention. Militant democracy is basically a theory that was espoused in connection with the rise and uh, the rise of the Nazi Party through ostensibly democratic means, which said that sometimes democracies can be threatened by the democratic procedures, and in those circumstances, there needs to be a mechanism to protect democracy, some sort of emergency powers to, to protect democracy itself from parties who would undermine the democratic order. So the argument here was that the Muslim Brotherhood, through its demonstrated ability to win elections, would have been in a position, essentially, to transform Egypt's, Egypt, the Egypt state into a Sunni version, virgin of Iran. Right? So, by consistently winning electoral majorities, we would be able to exploit the thin right, the thin uh, protection of personal rights <coughs> in the Constitution and impose essentially a theocratic order. Right? Now, in light of events, subsequent events, this theory in hindsight appears to have been a little short of delusional. 
But one did not need to await the July 3rd military coup to discount the plausibility of such a scenario. The behavior of both the military and the police in the wake of Mubarak's resignation and Morsi's election repeatedly demonstrated that they operated more in the nature of independent Praetorian guards who acted to maximize their own institutional interests and had absolutely no loyalty to a civilian chain of command. This was obvious from their repeated failures to protect uh, offices of the Muslim Brotherhood, offices of its affiliated political party, the Freedom of Justice Party, and even its failure to intervene when mobs burned down uh, businesses that were, were believed to be affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Indeed, the Ministry of Interior and the military even refused to defend the presidential palace when it was being attacked by demonstrators in the wake of Morsi's controversial November 2012 constitutional decrees. Now, Morsi, it's true, um, did not attempt a radical restructuring of the Ministry of Interior. Now, from my perspective, the reason for this is because he didn't have any power to do so. He might have had the legal authority to do so, but in practice he didn't have effective political power uh, that would enable him to do so. But for his opponents, his liberal and leftist opponents, this was taken not as a sign of his weakness, his institutional weakness, but rather that he was somehow in cahoots with the Mubarak security state and was conspiring to reinstall or recreate an authoritarian state, this time with the Muslim Brotherhood acting as the National Democratic Party of Mubarak. Again, I think subsequent evidence and the behavior of the military and the police in the June 30th movement and the coup so that this was just um, a preposterous interpretation of what was going on. But even if Morsi's critics had a reasonable basis for believing that he was collaborating with the security forces to crush his adversaries, Egyptian liberals and leftists had no reasonable basis to believe that once the military and the police intervened to remove Morsi, that they would be the beneficiaries of their intervention. Right? Um, so even if they believed that Morsi's intentions were uh, malevolent, it still seems that the only rational strategy uh, available to them at least if the goal is furthering Egyptian democracy, would have been to insist even more fanatically on the respect of legal formalities and insist on parliamentary elections as the proper means for bringing an end to the Muslim Brotherhood's allegedly anti-democratic uh, agenda and machinations. The fact that they instead turned to the military and the police to have the all too predictable consequence of discrediting political parties as the representatives of the Egyptian people to the benefit of the military and the police and other entrenched state institutions as the genuine representative of the people. So accordingly, the military, the militant democracy theory advanced to support the coup is missing its basic factual predicate, that military intervention would advance democracy rather than entrench authoritarian forces, indeed, the most authoritarian forces in the state. By eagerly supporting the military coup against democratic legitimacy, each of liberal and leftist opposition have essentially destroyed the conditions for democracy, at least in my opinion, in Egypt for the foreseeable future. It may be the case that the structural reasons that gave rise to the January 25th revolution will quickly undermine the status quo and generate new political possibilities. But the promise of a broad social coalition in favor of democracy in Egypt is gone. It certainly appears that the prospect for a peaceful, for, for a peaceful or relatively peaceful transition is dead. If the military and solid regime fails to establish political stability, Egypt faces the prospect of a lengthy period of political chaos in which state failure cannot be excluded as a real or even likely prospect. Egypt remains burdened by years of mismanagement and ill-considered policies which, while destructive of the common good, have succeeded in generating strong uh, domestic interest groups who will vehemently resist any effective reforms of these policies. It is hard to be optimistic about the prospects of the new government's ability to undertake these reforms even as, at the same time, is engaged in widespread political repression of the country's most organized political group, and one which, in principle at least, was in favor of undertaking those structural reforms. I would like to conclude with an observation from the 14th century Muslim jurist, historian, and philosopher, Misri Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun observed that there were three generic kinds of states. States that he called natural states, rational states, and religious states. Natural states were characterized by relations of domination, more than anything, between the ruler and the ruled. In this regime, the ruled consented to be dominated in exchange for the ruler's ability to protect them from the threats that they posed to each other. A security state, so to speak. 
A regime of domination places no moral checks against the depredations of the review, uh, uh, that the ruler can inflict on the rule. The only checks that exist at the depredations of the, of the ruler in the natural polity are the natural limitations inherent in domination. At some point in time, if the, the ruler overexploits his position of domination, the state simply can't generate enough resources to sustain the policy. And in fact, that's my interpretation of the January 25th Revolution. The, the Egyptian state was a state of domination. It had gone well beyond its capacity to generate enough surplus to maintain itself, hence it collapsed. The rational regime is one that uh, restrains the rule of pursuant to laws, laws uh, derived by appeal to reason, political philosophy, you might say, and sought to further the secular good of the community, not just the good of the ruler, as is the case of natural domination. Finally, the religious state, or what he calls the caliphate, sought to achieve the secular good of the community and their good the next life, in each case by applying laws derived from both religion and reason. While Ibn Khaldun argued for the superiority of the caliphate, because in his view it furthered the interests, human interests both in this life and the next, he recognized that the rational state and the religious state overlapped in that both pursued a conception of political good, and therefore the, the rational state was far superior to that of a natural state of domination. What liberal and leftist critics of the Muslim Brotherhood failed to realize was that for them, the choice was not really between a religious state or a rational state, as they thought, but rather the choice was between a state based in some kind of conception of public good, whether rational or religious, and one based on pure domination. In line with Ibn Khaldun's argument about the relationship between a religious conception of the state and a rational one, there should have been plenty of scope for agreement between these two different parties. Tragically, however, uh, the strategies that liberals and leftists adopted in pursuit of a non-religious state simply undermined the possibility of any kind of state committed to conception of public good and helped restore the return of authoritarianism. Thank you. Michelle is coming to the front for her comments. I've been asked to announce that your students have to do a class and I'll be good time to And there's actually a class in here at 115 as well. Oh, there's so a class here at 115. Uh, well, you should know that. Have a seat. Thank you for your time. I'm just going to let some people be. First one is with respect to the terminology that you use. using. I'm not always sure what you mean when I get to it in a minute. The second part refers to whether the Egyptian constitutions of 2012 meets what you call the rules criteria of modus vivendi. Third, is procedural democracy as you describe it and as reflected by the constitutionally, by the constitution, by the constitution generally speaking, sufficient for democratic transition. I know you don't make quite that point, but I still want to uh, highlight that a little bit. And I would like to suggest though at the end that rather than the crisis of liberalism, which I don't see a crisis of liberalism because it was enough to assume power. I would like to point out that the crisis of the Muslim Brotherhood as a political force for democratic uh, transition. I would we'll briefly speak to that argument. So you initiate your talk by discussing three reasons, three goals of the revolution of January 25. You talk about the minimalist argument, one which actually was for the toppling of the Mubarak regime and its friend. Then you mentioned uh, the second one, the more reformist attitude, which was more committed to legal order and uh, the will of the people. That particular view was associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. And thirdly, you highlight about the fundamental restructuring of the regime uh, by the liberal, what you call the liberal and socialist revolutionary, they were, in your words, the radical elements of the revolution and the cause of the failure of January 25. Now, 
I'm not sure what you mean by radical. Is, is the liberal agenda a radical agenda? Is, is it, uh, or is it more the absolutist positions, the non-negotiable positions that the liberal and socialist had that the, uh, soon after 2012, or the constitution of 2012? I, I'm not sure how you conflate liberal revolutionary and socialist revolutionary. I'm sure Muslim Brotherhood would not like to be conflated with Salafists. I think that's important to make quite a distinction when we talk about the different groups. Uh, let me just go back now, and I'm sure you have clarified that in your, in your response, I don't know if you have the space for that. The Egyptian constitution, um, here's a question. Did the Egyptian constitution of 2012 meet the very Rosian criteria of uh, modest vivendi that you're talking about? So I, I can't go and talk about all your paper and your talk, but I did go through some of the articles that you were referring to. One thing that I knew is that there was a very leg the, the constitution was legitimized because it was a very low turnover. I don't know. It was about 30 percent or so. And even among that 30 percent, there were just about 58 percent of the, so the people who actually voted uh, voted for it. So we talk about a third percent of the Egyptian public population voting for this constitution. Where is the modus vivendi here? Uh, let me go back to several articles that you referred to. Article 2, uh, Islam is the religion of the state and Arabic is its official language. Now this is the one that you refer to, but I found it highly problematic. Principle of Islamic Sharia are the principal source of legislation. Now this is the one little provision that often comes in constitution to overrule everything else that we really. And I think that you cannot just simply say it's just something that you can consult. It is written this way, principal source of legislation. Article 4, you refer to, I went back to the Constitution just to show, to read exactly the wording. Al-Azhar is an encompassing Islamic independent institution with exclusive autonomy over its affairs, responsible for pre preaching Islam, theology, and the Arab language in Egypt and the world. Al-Azhar are to be consulted, and you say consulted, in matters pertaining to Islamic law. Now, consulted about legislations, which Sharia is the principal source of legislation. So I don't see how they move that far away from it. Just remind me, one uh, journalist, uh, when Mubarak was elected, asked, it was a foreign journalist asked, uh, sorry, Morsi, and, and uh, one of the questions was, would you take a woman as a vice president? And Morsi responded, I'd have to consult higher authority. But what does this mean, higher authority? Let me continue to some of the issues of women. We don't speak much about family law issues and the issues of women. And I think that merits uh, Rolden's scrutiny and, and criteria of value immigrants. The constitutions may have prohibited discriminations between Egyptian citizens, but it did not explicitly prohibit discriminations against women. Discriminatory law and practices related to marriage, divorce, child custody, and inheritance were not addressed, simply not addressed. And since Sharia law happens to focus very heavily on family law, this is not something to take lightly. In fact, you could say that over 51% of, of the populations, as women, are actually being sidelined. And if they're being sidelined, where is the modest event of which is the criteria by which you are actually assessing the viability of the constitution of 2005? So I think that this is something to take seriously. You, you talk about the minority right issue. I think that's true. The Constitution here did address that and did make a good job in recognizing the three monotheistic religion, which really, in the case of Egypt, when you think about that, it's truly the, the cop, the Christian cop, need to be protected because they, they are 20, between 10 to 20 percent of the population. There are no Jews there. And, but they are Egyptian Baha'i, as we know, and they don't uh, have any form of protection. We wonder why not the other religion. Um, so I, I just think that this, you have sort of a two sympathetic positions on this, uh, on the constitutions of 2012, and I question uh, the validity of the rules and criteria in this respect. Third, I'm going a little bit fast, but there's of times. Third, we talk of, you focus mainly on the constitution as an important milestone 
uh, for democratic transition. And I realized you talked at the very beginning of talk, you talked about the fact that there are other positions that equally can explain democratic transitions and failures of transition, etc. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, constitutional change, constitutions as a mechanism for democratic transitions is only one piece of the puzzle. You have to just really bring that into mind. I mean, yeah, people, I mean, Aristotle knew the importance of constitution. He knew that there were contingents upon the form of regimes. Also, he knew that in order to make to secure, to, have, to make sure that constitutions are secure, you need to have a middle class. And if you didn't have a middle class, it wouldn't happen. The problem is that we have a thinning of the Egyptian middle class. Of course, that's a problem in securing uh, constitution in whatever form. And the third problem uh, was, of course, you can change constitution. And you can change it in ways that are uh, uh, problematic for you know, from the perspective of human rights. Right. Um, the last point I, I'd like to make, and I'm sorry if I rush through this, I, I just found that I was, uh, we had less time than I was hoping for. Um, I would like to suggest that revolutions are made in three stages. The first stage, um, it's a stage where the regime is stopped. First, the immediate immediate. Then there is a second stage, and it's a stage of consolidation. And then there is a third stage, and it's not always inevitable, it's a stage of democratization. Those stages are not going always in sequences, but they are just there, and you would hope that everyone, they will unfold in one way or the other, even though they can be still. They are setbacks. The problem is, in my opinion, and from my reading of what has gone in Egypt since January 25th of 2011, is that the Muslim Brotherhood, who had the only was the only group which had the capacity to become hegemon. Was not succeed, did not succeed in developing an, uh, a shared worldview. And I think that the constitutions of 2012 is a testing case. They did not succeed. In fact, we saw a lot of unrest unfolding as a result of the constitution. They did not succeed in delivering social and economic groups. Egypt, Egypt in fact, under Morsi. Uh, reached a peak of economic distress that was unprecedented. They were not able to partner with the military. And that is a problem we want to create order during the process of consolidation. And this is so ironic because Morsi, after all, was the one who actually elevated Al Sisi. And Al Sisi comes back and just takes power away from him. So, on all those categories, from a in capacity to develop a, a shared world, delivering social and economic goods, partnering with military, and ultimately creating a trusting environment for international monetary funds to act in uh, uh, for, uh, the, for the international monetary fund to provide loans and other foreign loans. That in itself shows that this was not a possibility that over the Muslim Brotherhood were not able to actually um, do what they were entrusted to do by the Egyptian population. Now, this doesn't mean that I, I, I support the proof. I want to clear that about that, but on the contrary. But here's some food for thought, I have to Some food for thought, maybe for the next class. <laughs> <laughs> so, after the, I think, just, just to throw it out here. After the 1848 European Revolution, very similar, a very similar uh, uh, example between the 1848 uh, revolutions and the uh, Egyptian revolutions of the Arab Spring of 2011, liberals and representatives of the popular classes and institutional monarchies would prove equally incapable of governing. What happened as a result of that, we would have a military court, Napoleon Bonaparte III, which was inevitable in 1851. He was a self-appointed leader of the people and used popular support to provide stability and order. But the issue that I'm really trying here to highlight is that history shows that if a rising hegemonic group cannot meet the criteria of consolidation in a revolutionary process, a Bonaparte is inside. So I would not be surprised if the next ICC now, um, you all know that when Kissinger asked John Lane's assessment of the French Revolution, what he responded, he responded, it is too early to say, 
I think that unfortunately this is still the case uh, to say regarding the Egyptian revolution. It's too early to say, but we definitely see extraordinary trajectory path between the 1848 revolutions and the Arabs. That's great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. My apologies to Micheline, to Mohammed, and to everyone here. We thought we had this room work at least for another 10 minutes. We could get into some back and forth. All I can offer you is that we are organizing an eviction conference, a conference on Egypt's democratic transition, early next year, perhaps we can convene further.